I want to talk, actually, about water and power. And I, I'm not sure if you guys noticed, my picture is not actually on the panel for this, for, this, uh, for this panel today, because when I was starting to talk to the Chicago Ideas Week folks about you know, what I've been thinking about recently and what I care about right now, they couldn't decide if I should go for the water panel or the power panel, the energy panel. Um, so I think they changed their mind a few times. But I'm actually really glad to be here today. Um, no matter what, I would have talked about the same things because these two topics are no longer mutually exclusive in my mind. Um, but energy is sort of where my, my passion really began. So I'm happy to be here. So today I have uh, some working some thoughts that I've been uh, exploring, and I, I, I want to share them with you, and everyone can shoot them apart, but I'm pretty excited about them. One, my thesis is that uh, in terms of solving the challenges facing the future for power and water, the right solutions involve small distributed technologies that can be networked together and then scaled up. So uh, this, I, as, as we explore this, I'll introduce you to concepts such as microgrids and then eventually shifting into a micro-utility, but I'll also tell you about why I've come to this, this conclusion. So first of all, why water and power together? Water and power, I believe, are two of the most important measures of uh, quality of life and economic success. So let's take a very simplistic point of view, <laughs> very simplistic, and look at the world and divide countries into two categories, one of advanced economies and one of emerging economies. When you look at advanced economies, there's, there's a couple of things we know are true. They have reliable access to power and water. And if you look at the emerging economies, we also can see something that's quite clear. They don't have reliable access to power and water. Now, back to the advanced economies. So as we actually have seen some slides showing this, over the past you know, 100 years, uh, a lot of, several countries in this world have put a lot of effort behind um, you know, building out massive infrastructure that can deliver you know, reliable power and water. So this included many of the power plants that we saw pictures of today, whether it's you know, nuclear power plants or wind farms or coal generation plants. And then we've also, those countries have also focused on building um, centralized water collection and treatment plants to, to make sure there's a steady water source for the communities around them. There, by doing this, that also meant we had to build distribution systems. So um, here are high voltage DC lines that we're actually, we've probably seen around, and that's the way we transmit the electricity we generate somewhere, um, wasting the heat, and then to the, where people want to actually consume that electricity. Um, water needs distribution systems too. Um, you know, to the left-hand side, you'll see an aqueduct of the Californian persuasion, and on the right-hand side, you'll see an aqueduct of the ancient Roman persuasion. Um, one's prettier than another, I think. But um, so, you know, we need to transport water too, which is takes a lot of space, a lot of energy. It's kind of complicated. You know, you have to dig up streets and put pipes in there. You know, in your house, you have to make sure you're transporting water to all different parts for for the needs. So, all of these are really big issues. Now, when you think of um, the emerging economies, not only do we have a lack of generation, we also have a lack of distribution. Um, so, you know, this is when I think about water distribution, for instance, um, the current distribution channels right now is actually human labor. Um, and then on the right hand side is a truck of water, a water tanker that just drives water around to people when they need it. Um, this is, I think, in Mumbai. So um, we make do with, with uh, distribution systems, but clearly the learnings from the advanced economies has not quite made it over to the emerging economies, not for a lack of trying, but we, we know that there's still you know, a third of the world's population without water and power, and we still have a lot of work to do. So as I think about that, I've actually, um, I tried to spend the last, uh, oh, he, one other part is that in the advanced economies, where we do have all these, um, where we have built out this infrastructure, it's also getting old and it's aging. So there's, we're actually at a, a really important moment in time right now where everyone's actually facing infrastructure problems. Either you don't have it, or the stuff you have doesn't work anymore and you need to fix it. So that's the fact, this moment in time, that capture, that frame of time that we were talking about earlier, it caused me to start reflecting on the last 10 years of my career. 
So I actually um, became passionate about the built environment during my civil engineering studies at Stanford. And there we were learning about how to design, build, and manage the construction of safe, reliable, sometimes beautiful, and sometimes cost-effective uh, built environment, <laughs> whether it was buildings, bridges, roads, whatever. Um, but what was fascinating to me during that time was that while we were learning a lot of really important skills, it was all, we were learning it based on the assumption that the world around us was static, that the same design solutions we had used for the past 100 years made a lot of sense for the next 100 years. So I, I guess I didn't really quite believe that was true, so I decided to start tackling the built environment piece by piece over the next few years. My first, my first job out of school was an energy efficiency consultant where uh, we looked at how to make small municipal buildings uh, perform more efficiently. Then I jumped over to Google where, among other things, so my first projects were actually focused on building out um, really great workspaces for their employees to work. And so we looked at office buildings and we introduced green building concepts. We, we made wonderful indoor air quality. We brought in a lot of daylight. We even sourced some of the first cradle-to-cradle -cradle certified building materials to ensure that we were thinking about the life, you know, the sustainability and the waste that would eventually be created you know, over the life of these buildings. So we, we kind of mastered that. And our next, our, the next logical step to us was, well, let's start generating clean power on site. So um, we were in California. So we thought solar makes a lot of sense. And uh, so we went. And uh, the, at the time, this was 2004, 2005. So solar was actually still quite expensive. And so we thought, OK, we'll get the economies of scale, scale by just going big. So we put over 9,000 panels on every rooftop we could find. Where we couldn't find rooftops, we built carports and put them on top of those. And um, we, you know, we installed 1.8 megawatts of solar. Um, after, you know, so Google, you know, that was great. We started executing a lot of things, really big projects. Um, then I actually decided to go back to school, back to Stanford, and you know, I was getting an MBA, so the logical thing is to spend all your free time thinking about water, because that's what every MBA student does. Um, so, you know, then I started thinking about the large, massive water infrastructure projects that, or infrastructure challenges that were facing the American Southwest. So instead of going on, you know, exotic uh, spring break trips, I decided to go on road trips where we, you know, you start up in the San Joaquin Delta and drive along the aqueducts, see where all that water's going, who's using it, how it's getting there, end up in Los Angeles, talk to the scary LAWDP, which is like the scariest agency I've ever talked to in my life, and then, you know, of course, end up in Vegas, where instead we actually went, stared face to face to these huge turbines inside of the Hoover Dam. All of that was water related. Then I took a quick, a quick stint at the Department of Energy as a fellow there, where we were throwing hundreds of millions of dollars at uh, renewable energy innovation and, and projects to try to read the, lead the country back to the road of financial prosperity. Then I went to Europe because I thought, hey, wind energy is where it's at. And so I went to go work for one of the largest wind energy OEMs, where I learned quickly that product, develop, the product development meant to them was building bigger things. So <laughs> you could see this was the last product while I was there. It was a they released, I mean, you can't build this right yet, this was their concept, was they built a seven megawatt um, offshore wind turbine where each blade was longer than nine um, London double-decker buses in a row. And there's three of those blades, by the way, on a turbine. So I couldn't believe it. I was stand I, as I reflect back on these 10 years, all I could think about was how big everything was got getting. And it still didn't even seem like we were making a dent. There was still, you know, one third of the world's population without power. The U.S. was still kind of crappy in terms of how we supplied power, the, uh, people's experiences, more outages were going, you know, were occurring. And it just didn't, I wasn't quite sure bigger was necessarily better anymore. So my thesis, again, is going back to things, making things smaller. So now I have the privilege of working with um, someone who's, I think, figured this out a long time ago. His name's Dean Kamen, and he's a famed inventor, uh, mostly in the biomedical device field, something I know nothing about. But all I do know is that some of his most successful products were, was offering small, elegant solutions in ways that eliminated the need for big, huge, clunky solutions. He, for instance, invented the wearable insulin pump that maybe many of you use, 
um, which quickly eliminated the, the need for um, diabetics to have to go to the hospital to get their insulin sh shots. He also invented the home dialysis machine, which again eliminated the need for dialysis patients to have to go to the wherever, whatever center was closest to them. And he even invented a very tiny, flexible, lightweight, yet really strong heart stent that re re eliminated the need for surgeons to crack open your chest for open heart surgery. So we're all lucky that he applied these design principles towards some water and power technologies. And it's through my, my job, which is trying to take these now working technologies and turning them into businesses and making sure they're out in the world, it's through my experience here with these technologies that I started really becoming a believer in distributed solutions. So let's just do a quick, a quick scenario. What do I mean by this? Let's say, um, let's just focus on the US. Let's say I'm a homeowner, or 10,000 homeowners go out and buy a Honda backup generator, which a lot of people do with, they experience a lot of power outages. Most neighbors, for instance, wouldn't go complain that their neighbor just bought a generator and put it in their home. So as an individual unit, that generator is useful to one person and doesn't really bother other people. But let's say you take all those generators and the power company says, look, I'm gonna connect those intelligently and I'm gonna use them when I need them for in the case of a big peaker event or you know, peak event or some sort of outage, I'm gonna use your generator and have that be my backup power as the power company. Now suddenly, as a power company, you've just built a peaker plant without having to build anything without having to build any distribution and not having to worry about that permitting hassle you're gonna have with people who don't want you to build a power plant. So now the same can happen with water. So let's say I, let's say 10,000 people go out and they buy a really effective water filtration solution that can actually clean any water in your house and turn it into potable, usable water. So no long, you're, release, you're now reducing the load on the water supply to your house. You can ensure it's good quality, and you can in fact increase water supply by taking what is now waste and turning it into something useful. And if I was the water utility or the water manager, I would go start talking to those homeowners and saying, hey, I'll make a deal. Why don't you sell me some water back when we really need it in the time of drought or some sort of fluke contamination issue? So again, these concepts are very parallel and, and synergistic. These things I'm describing to you, the power, the power example I gave you, for instance, is what people think, it's, you know, it's a topic of a microgrid. Microgrids, is a, it's a very popular topic today, and there's a lot of people trying to figure out how to enhance that in the United States. And that, in, um, you know, that is a combination of the right kind of hardware and the right kind of software and the right type of intelligence that connects it together. Now, I would like to say that we should expand that microgrid concept into a micro-utility concept. And that would include water. There's no reason we should be ignoring it right now, and there's no reason why it can't have that same bi-directional, multi-directional flow that electricity can. So with the right technology and the right th thinking about it, we can actually start building up reliable backup power grids and reliable water grids without having to actually lift a finger. So obviously, going back to the emerging economies, all of these, it, all of these examples make a lot of sense where infrastructure doesn't exist. But today, I just, I was really happy to share with you about the fact that I think we're in this one moment in time where this type of solution can actually leapfrog, you know, be that leapfrog innovation in places where we don't have infrastructure, but it can also be the necessary solution for us where we do have infrastructure. So thank you very much, and uh, thanks for having me. <laughs>